Hello, it's still Sunday. I'm still vlogging on my phone because I still don't know where my camera is. And I'm still reading Haruki Murakami's uh, Colourless Sakura Tazaki and his Years of Pilgrimage, which I'm very much enjoying at the moment. It's, it's probably like 4.25 out of 5 for me at the moment. So yes, that is where we're at. All right. Maybe I'll see you on my camera later. I, I keep being like... Oh my god, almost knocked my drink over. I keep thinking like, oh, well, maybe it's in this place. Maybe it's in that place. It doesn't help that I was drunk as well. I don't know. Maybe it'll turn up. Hello. Oh my god, I'm losing my voice. Um, I've finished reading Haruki Murakami. I don't know if I said that. And I've been reading Oranges Are Not The Only Fruit by Jeanette Winterson. I'm about two thirds of the way through it now. It's very good. Uh, Biggie is behind me somewhere. There he is. Um, yeah, it's very good. It's probably like a 4, maybe a 4.25 out of 5. Um, it's kind of interesting for me because it it's set in England, but it also deals with like Christianity. And I was raised, at, well, I went to a primary school that was a Catholic school. Um, so a lot of that like brings back memories of my youth, I guess. Also, it's got some LGBTQ themes, which are very good. And yeah, really enjoying it so far. I will probably finish it, probably not tonight, but tomorrow morning. And then I've also finished my bedtime book, Alan Choring the Enigma. But basically now there's an author's note and then there are the notes on the text. So I want to read those. So I'm going to try and finish those tonight and update you on them tomorrow. And then I might try and read To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf, but we'll see. Oh, and I went to an anxiety meeting thing today. Um, so yeah, uh, it's like an anxiety group session thing. And uh, I, you know, I can't really talk about what, I, what went on during the session anyway because of confidentiality with the other patients and stuff. But it seemed to go pretty well and uh, yeah, got some new coping strategies and stuff. So hopefully be able to look after my anxiety a bit more. Good. Your height couldn't be reached by pole vaulters. <laughs> You're built like the pole that pole vaulters fall over. Bars. Hello. Oh my God, I'm losing my voice. Um, I've finished reading Haruki Murakami, I don't know if I said that, and I've been reading Oranges Are Not The Only Fruit by Jeanette Winterson, I'm about two thirds of the way through it now, it's very good, uh, Biggie is behind me somewhere, there he is, um, yeah it's very good, it's probably like a 4, maybe a 4.25 out of 5, um, it's kind of interesting for me because it, it's set in England but it also deals with like Christianity, and I was raised, at, well I went to a primary school that was a Catholic school, um, so a lot of that like brings back memories of my youth, I guess. Also, it's got some LGBTQ themes, which are very good. And yeah, really enjoying it so far. I will probably finish it, probably not tonight, but tomorrow morning. And then I've also finished my bedtime book, Alan Turing, The Enigma. But basically now there's an author's note and then there are the notes on the text. So I want to read those. So I'm going to try and finish those tonight and update you on them tomorrow. And then I might try and read To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf, but we'll see. Okay, cool. Oh, and I went to an anxiety meeting thing today. Um, so yeah, uh, it's like an anxiety group session thing. And, uh, I, you know, I can't really talk about what, I, what went on during the session anyway because of confidentiality with the other patients and stuff. But it seemed to go pretty well and, uh, yeah, got some new coping strategies and stuff. So hopefully be able to look after my anxiety a bit more. Good. Bonsoir, chat. Ça va bien? Oui, ça va bien, non? Voudrez-vous le nourriture de chat? <laughs> oui. S'il vous plaît. Oui, merci. Oui. Mange. Mange tout. Oui. Send help, I'm being bullied. Ah. 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 My internet is terrible today, so uh, yeah, I can watch YouTube, but only 
if I watch it on that screen. I can't cast it to my TV, which is annoying. But yeah, I have been tidying a little bit. So you can see how like, I still very much need to tidy. But I do have this new rug and it's biggie colored. So that's good. Anyway, what is new? So yeah, I have been cleaning and tidying my house because I got somebody coming over tomorrow to play some music. So I'm just trying to make it look as though I live in a normal people house, really. Um, I've also obviously been doing lots of reading. I went to town earlier as well. I was gonna get my hair cut and the hairdressers has moved. So I need to Google them and be like, where, where are you now? Um, but yeah, I've got this book here, which is The Power of Moments, Chip Heath and Dan Heath. This is a non-fiction business book. I didn't read the full thing. Basically, I uh, do these sort of 2,000 word spark notes summaries of books for a client. And so I can kind of skim read to find the most important sections and then I just read those <laughs> sections basically. Um, so yeah, and also now that I've finished with that, I'll be selling that on my eBay store. I've finished reading my bedtime book, which is Alan Turing, The Enigma by Andrew Hodges. This is a beast. Look at how tiny the print is and like how dense it is. And it's still 600 pages. I think it's actually only like 520 and then the last 80 pages are like the author's note and all of the notes on the text, which I also read. So yes, but it was very fascinating. I mean, Alan Turing was an incredible person, incredible human being, really sad story. I mean, he basically is one of the main reasons why the Allies won the war because him and his team at Bletchley Park helped to decode the German Enigma machine. And so there's a lot of that in here. And actually what's interesting is that it turns out like the Germans, they, they could have very easily have made the Enigma uncrackable, but basically, they designed the machine and thought the machine was so good that they weren't worried about human error. So human error combined with like mathematical genius basically was what enabled the allies to then, you know, decode the enigma. But he also did lots of other stuff. I mean, he was kind of fundamental in the creation of the computer and wrote a number of really important um, like papers and stuff like that on it. And then towards the end of his life, uh, he was a homosexual at a time in which it was illegal to be gay. And basically he had like a lover and he told his, lo like he was talking to his lover and then his lover told a friend about Alan Turing. And then the friend broke into Turing's house. Turing reported it to the police and then they arrested Turing for gross indecency. And it's like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> God damn it. Uh, I mean, at least... Like, there's, there has actually now been, like, pardons issued to all of the people who were charged and stuff. But, I mean, he killed himself as well. Not I, I don't know whether he did killed himself because of it, but, yeah. Yeah, very sad, but very moving book. And now I'm just coming to the end of The Tragedy of the Carrasco by Arthur Conan Doyle. Weirdly, this has an introduction by Tony Robinson, who was Baldrick in Blackadder. I suppose he did also do Time Team, but I still don't really understand why he's doing the intro to this, but yeah, a really cool book. I mean, it's kind of definitely a product of its time. It's basically a bunch of people are going around uh, along the Nile and they get kidnapped by Arabs on camels. And then the Arabs are like, convert to Islam or we'll kill you. And they're like, no, we are brave, strong Christians. And then I, well, I'm like 15 pages from the end and I'm pretty sure all the Arabs are about to get massacred now. So that's nice. Uh, but yeah, I would probably, so far this has been like a 3.75 out of 5, and the Alan Turing was 3.5 out of 5, just because it was so dense, like such an arduous read. It was my bedtime book for like three months. And also a lot of it was just totally over my head because there was some like detailed mathematical concepts in it that I'm just like, I don't, I don't understand these. I'm not a mathematician. But yeah, that's where I'm at. And now I'm off to spend my evening continuing to tidy. I also forgot to mention that yesterday I went to an open mic at the Chilton Taps um, because I still don't know where my camera is and um, because for other reasons, mainly involving laziness, I didn't take any video footage. Uh, I did take a photo of the pizza that I ordered though, so maybe I'll put that in. Uh, or you could just go on to Dane's Vegan Journey on Instagram. However, uh, my set didn't go very well. I don't know, I tried doing some new covers which I haven't tried before and I don't know, maybe I should just stick to doing the same stuff I always do, but that's super boring. Oh, and I don't know if I mentioned, but on Monday I went to a mental health meetingy thingy. So I've got to do this, I've got to do some hot cross bun diagrams, where they're called that because they look like a hot cross bun. I'm going to show you this one because this is the one they gave us and not the one that I created about what was giving me anxiety. <laughs> so, oh dear. Always 
wanna play, but you never wanna lose. Aerials in the sky. When you lose your mind, you free your life. Life is a waterfall We're one in the river and one again after the fall Right, new song. I guess it's called Believe In Me. I guess? I don't know. Doesn't really matter. so beautiful, I'll take her down, down, down To the place where I go when I just want to be alone There's nothing to see here, I'm trying to be The best that I can be They make it look so easy on the TV screen in the sky when the street lights go out There's a reason I believe in the evening stretched out ahead of me relentlessly Maybe the glass isn't half empty after all Maybe there's I give her goosebumps when I play guitar She gives me shivers when she She stole my cigarettes by accident Reminding me I need to quit smoking And if I collapse in the street Or if I die in my sleep Believe in me Sometimes it's easy in the sky when the street lights are out There's a reason I believe in the evening stretched out ahead of me relentlessly Maybe the glass isn't half empty after all Maybe there's some Stand here and I'll watch the running tide. The sea looks so lonely and it has a lot to hide. Who will take their place inside this song? That crows. Mm. 
Someone on the internet suggested getting garlic bread and topping it with pesto, so I did and it looks amazing. And I'm watching a TED talk about anxiety and depression. I'll link to this below if I, if I remember, because it's uh, probably worth watching. Yo, what up? I feel terrible today, and I shouldn't really. I didn't drink, oh actually you know, I had a pint yesterday. Okay, let me tell you about the weekend. So, I think I updated you about Thursday when I had someone come over and we played some music, so that was good. We'll hopefully do that again soon. I actually need to, today, I need to type up my notes and then make a playlist uh, of the songs that we're going to learn. So there's that. On the, Then on Friday, I hosted the open mic at the Art Centre. It tipped it down with rain, so not that many people came in the end. Although we did have to, we did, I felt really bad because one person, we had to, you know, they, they didn't get a chance to play. And that was because uh, another group were playing and we let them play like five or six songs because we thought we could squeeze it in. But then it took a little bit of a while to, um, for them to get ready and stuff. But the reason they wanted to play is because they're kind, they kind of involved with the Arts Centre and do some volunteer stuff. But they'd also organised a big event that happened yesterday. So a band called Tankus the Henge played in the old church space. And um, yeah, a couple of other bands opened up for them, and I worked the bar, so it's the second time I've worked the bar there. It was fucking mental. It was crazy. Like, it didn't stop. I mean, I think the doors opened at half seven, and the first time we had a point where nobody was at the bar was probably about quarter past eleven. And uh, yeah, so there were like four of us in this one bar, then there was another bar in another room where there were two people working and we like at one point we were absolutely screwed like we did really needed help and we had this whatsapp group so i messaged being like can somebody come and help and like nobody replied so i ran over and then they got a massive queue as well so it was like okay so they're struggling too we ran out of change nobody had any change um like there was a point where like people were asking for drinks and like i was having to say like we we don't have any cold ones because we've emptied the fridge and we haven't had a chance to restock the fridge so but yeah it was good and i think most people had a really good time the music was cool i got a few clips which i probably put in and um yeah it was nice and it's i really like doing that and volunteering i mean the art center is a registered charity as well so um you know it's cool to just just to go along and help um, but then it's nice to do a little bit of volunteer work as well and to, you know, to volunteer for, I guess, for a charity and organisation that I, you know, believe in. Um, but also, like, for me, from my point of view, well, actually, um, I don't even know if I'm supposed to say this, but they, like, they gave me some money, which I wasn't expecting. Like, as far as I was concerned, it was like a volunteer thing. And then we got some tips and I wasn't even expecting tips. So, so I think I got like five, six pound in tips. Um, which was a nice surprise. Um, but then they gave me some, like they gave me like an envelope with a bit, a bit of cash in there as well. I mean, to be fair, I don't know how much money they made on the bar, but I bet it was a lot. But yeah, but that was a nice surprise. Like that's not why, why I was there, you know? But I do think, I do have my reasons though. Like, so there are a couple of things because I work from home, I never get to work as part of a team. So for me to be able to work with, again, it was like six of us, well, there were like six of us doing the bar, but then there were like a few people who were on the board there who were just doing what was needed. So for example, at one point the toilets broke, so they were helping fix that and like going to get money for us and stuff. Um, there's, well, I say a kid, he's like, I think 16, 17. Um, but this person I know anyway, they, they were doing the lighting, which was cool. So I um, chatted to them a little bit. And like a lot of my friends were there just for the event. So um, like my mate Dave, who I play in, in the ilk with, uh, the guy with the hat, <laughs> that's how I was explaining him. Um, he was there, so like I served him like four pints or something, which was funny. Because every time I saw him, I was like, all right, Dave, cider. <laughs> and like, I don't have to tell him how much it is because he knows. So, um, but yeah, it's really nice to work as part of a team, which I don't get working as a freelancer from home. And um, I mean, also like this event, it was £15 entry. I got to see it for free. So that was pretty cool. Um, and yeah, also one other thing is that with bar work, I think it's worth me getting to, getting to know how to run a bar because obviously I'm self-employed and whatnot. And just being able to work behind a bar and to run a bar it would be nice to have in the same way that it's nice that like, I've passed my driving test so I can drive now. I don't need to drive, but you never know when you might need to. And it's the same with bar work, I think. Like, you know, I don't know, maybe, who knows, in 10 years, 
AI might be writing everything. We might be reading books by the latest hot algorithm. So I might be out of a job. Although then they'd probably have bar robots. So then I'd, I'd probably still be screwed. Maybe I should just learn how to program robots. Maybe that's, maybe that's what I should do. Anyway, reading update. I was reading um, Down Under by Bill Bryson and I have no idea where it went. So I'm pretty sure I didn't take it out of the house. And I, I, I think I tried to read some of it when I got back from the art center on Friday and I don't know where it's gone. So I've lost a book inside my house. So I switched instead to uh, Milk by Emma Rosen. And I'm really enjoying this, I'm about halfway through. I just want to show you this one as well. This is uh, Michael Smith, The Secrets of Station X, How Bletchley Park Helped Win the War. So that, weirdly, these are all three. All three of these are non-fiction. And all three of these were in my um, like my bedtime books pile next next to my bed. Um, and the reason for that is because those are the where I put the books where I think I'm going to want to read them just a bit at a time, you know, 25 pages at a time. Um, because... You know, I don't want reading to feel like a chore, if that makes sense. So that's what I did with the Alan Turing book that I read, because I couldn't have just read that as my main book, it would have killed me. And all three of these books are on that pile, and all three of them, I started reading them and was like, no, these these are good enough to be main books. So, um, yeah, so when I couldn't find Down Under, I've just moved straight into Milk. About halfway through this, this is uh, it's subtitled A Story of Breastfeeding in a Society That's Forgotten How. And... Um, so that's kind of why it was in my bedtime pile, really, because it's like, well, I, I don't breastfeed. I, like, um, but like also, I don't intend to have kids. I mean, maybe I will. It's not something I've ruled out. I think if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I would have said I'd ruled it out. It's not something I've ruled out. I think, if anything, for me and like my belief system, I personally want to adopt, I think. Um, I don't know. I think it, I actually find it weird that people are like... Um, People say like, oh, don't get a cat from a breeder, adopt a cat, because there are cats that need housing. But then when it comes to children, they just have their own child. And it's like, but there are like, orphan kids need parents, like foster parents are needed. And also for the environment, the worst thing you can do is have a kid. <laughs> so so that's what I thought it was strange actually at um, Extinction Rebellion they had um, they staged like a load of mothers were breastfeeding their children as part of the protest and I kind of get it because the symbology it's like children are, are our future we need to save the planet for the people who are coming after us so I get that symbolism but also it's a bit of a mixed message because again having a child is the worst thing you can do it's just you're doubling your own carbon footprint basically I mean you're then responsible for an entire human beings carbon footprint throughout their entire life so um i don't know where i was going with this rant oh yeah so so because of that like i just didn't think i'd be particularly interested in the subject matter but emma's actually done a really great job of all of the the actual research behind it so she's covered a lot of stuff like the history of breastfeeding uh, even things like what milk means to our society and fair play to her she pointed out that most people are lactose intolerant or at least to a certain extent um, and we're not designed to drink milk from other species. And actually, she uses that to lend argument, uh, lend you know credence to her argument that we should be doing more breastfeeding as a society, society around the globe, uh, which I agree with that argument based on the information she shared anyway. Um, but it also is the same argument for not drinking cow's milk. It's like it's not designed for you. Don't you know? Don't. <laughs> so, um, yeah, some really interesting stuff about formula as well. And so where I am at the moment, she's sort of talking more about society's attitudes towards breast milk and her experiences breastfeeding and stuff. And, she, and like how she was treated in the hospital wasn't great. Like, basically, I mean, to be fair, I mean, my mum works for the NHS, so I'm kind of very aware of how overstretched the NHS are. But, um, yeah, she didn't have the best birthing experience. And I think a lot of people assumed... Because they've, you know, helped a thousand mothers or whatever, they assumed that every mother already knows everything without being told. And it's like, for example, they didn't they didn't tell her where like changes of sheets and towels and clothes were. They told her husband, but not her. And her hus husband went home. So, I, I, I was like, I think she told him to. She was like, go and get some rest. But because, you know, there's so much information and they just didn't bother telling her. It's, it's really strange. So there are lots of bits in this that have like, kind of made my blood boil. But um, yeah, really enjoying reading it. This is probably on on course for possibly a four stars. Um, and the same goes for this, really. The Secrets of Station X, How Bletchley Park Helped Win the War. So this was mainly on my bedtime pile because obviously I just read that Alan Turing book. But I picked this up and started reading it. It's only about 300 pages long and it, it's really interesting already in the first 10 pages. I mean, I think 
The opening paragraph kind of got me. The sudden increase in activity up at the old Leon estate led to a great deal of excitement in the sleepy Buckinghamshire town of Bletchley in the last few months of 1938. Amid the deteriorating situation in Europe, where war with Hitler and Nazi Germany seemed unavoidable, there was no shortage of suggestions as to why workmen might be so busy laying concrete, installing a new water main, digging in power cables and laying telephone lines to connect the old mansion house at Bletchley Park to Whitehall's corridors of power. So I just thought that was a pretty cool start, especially for uh, non-fiction. So, as you can tell, it's, this is all kind of, these have all mo moved over into my main books. And it means I've been kind of burning through my bedtime books pile, which is good. So my next one I've got, which I might also bring through, is called Framed by Ronnie O'Sullivan, who's a snooker player. And he's like my, my favourite snooker player. I'm not sure whether he wrote it or not, because it is quite badly written. So it is possible that he wrote it as opposed to a ghostwriter. I feel like if it is a ghostwriter, it's not a very good ghostwriter. Um, but I'm kind of perversely enjoying it and it's kind of I guess turned into this thriller that this guy owns a snooker club and uh his brother woke up covered in blood doesn't know why um and he kind of ran to the snooker club and then eventually the cops came kind of came along but now we're kind of investigating well did he kill these people did he not was he framed as per the title um yeah I mean uh, well, I read 50 pages of it last night because I couldn't sleep. So, and there's only 300 pages, so I'm kind of like, should I just, should I just finish it? But I, I want to finish Milk first, either way. So I'm going to finish Milk, and then I'll see where I'm at. So anyway, I think I have waffled on for long enough. So that's about it for this week's vlog. As always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so, what you thought about them. Hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.